a 3-5 player, you want to move up to 4-0, but you think your forehand sucks. You're missing it too much, you're not confident in it, you're not getting enough power, and that is really what you think is keeping you from 3-5 to 4-0. And you might as well be right, because better players are taking more advantage of opportunities with their forehand. All right, let's go and fix it then. I'm gonna show you in this video the three most common mistakes that I see with my 3-5 players. And of course, I'm also gonna show you the drills with which to fix those mistakes. The first most common mistake that I'm seeing at 3-5 is that players are letting the ball drop below their ideal strike zone. Now on this last ball, Jason is catching it in the ideal strike zone. And that means between hip and shoulder. So if I'm slowing this down here, you see that he's making contact just about waist hip high. So that is comfortable. And if we're looking at the ball as it's coming to him, it's not dropping a whole lot. So the ball is on its way up to apex. Apex is probably about here and the ball doesn't significantly drop. However, on the next ball, we're seeing the problem with letting the ball drop pretty dramatically. So not only are you losing lots of control, you may shank the ball, you're off balance, you're stretching, you're definitely not transferring your weight into the ball the way you should, but more significantly, you're allowing your opponent to reset because you give him more time. So what I mean by that is, if we're looking at where the ball is on apex here, at the top of its bounce, I wanna say it's about here. So imagine if Jason could have moved up there and that would have still let him hit the ball between hip and shoulder, but instead he's letting it drop. So that means that the ball has more time to travel to him and then also away from him. And that is a time factor. So if you can move up to these balls, that is one way to put a lot of pressure on your opponent without having to hit harder. By letting the ball drop, you're actually leaving a lot of power and control on the table. And those are two things that you need if you wanna move up to a higher level. So it makes a lot of sense why people let the ball drop. Either they haven't been trained to move up and take balls either on the rise or at least the apex, the top of the bounce, they're not perceiving it. Newer players especially struggle with seeing the depth, the height of the incoming ball. And there's the time factor. If you're letting the ball drop past the apex, that is when the ball is actually slowing down a little bit. If you're going up to a ball and taking it on the rise, it has a lot more action coming up to you right from the bounce. So it is more comfortable a lot of times to let the ball drop. But what you're doing is, let's say if I'm rallying a regular ball and I'm hitting this here or even further back, that might feel more comfortable for me. But imagine I'm taking the same ball just, what, three, four, five feet further inside the court. I'm going to put pressure on that person by taking time away from them. And that is what you want to do at the higher levels. It is not so much about hitting harder because for most players, hitting harder means also losing a little bit more control. Try to take time away from your opponent by moving up. And one of the greatest drills, one of the most simplest drills that I know for this is the calling the bounce drill. It all starts with perception. If you're not able to judge the depth and the height of the ball properly, it's not going to get into your brain that all of a sudden you need to move forward if it's a shorter ball or back up on a higher ball. So the first drill is a perception drill. It's called call the bounce. So you are calling the incoming ball's depth. If it's short, you say short. And of course you move up to it. You're not just saying short and then you're doing one of these guys. If it's a ball where you don't necessarily have to move a whole lot, you can say hold. And if it's a ball where you feel that you need to move back to let that ball back down into your strike zone, you say back. Back. Up. Back. Up. And I'm just trying to adjust with my footwork to keep that ball at all times between your shoulder and your hip because that is where it's more comfortable. 
And the reason why we're missing, oh, very short. The reason why you miss Florian's is you're not getting into the proper position to replicate good technique. Second very common mistake that I see at the 3-5 level is the non-use of the left arm, of the non-dominant arm, until the very end. So in the beginning here, Jason's doing a really good job using his offhand right here to facilitate the unit turn, to get a good coil. But now as we're rolling this forward, you see that his left arm is just dropping down to his left side instead of staying out here to help balance. Now, if we're going to set Ash Barty next to this, look at the left hand, how far she's using the left arm to help her coil. She's releasing basically behind her body, but now look what the left arm is doing as she's hitting. It's not ever dropping down. And that is to maintain balance and to complete the full hip and shoulder rotation. Looking at Roger Federer here, same thing. The left arm stays out in front and he's doing the absolute classic catching the racket with his left hand after he's completely done with the shot. Second most common mistake is that a lot of players are doing great with their offhand to facilitate the unit turn, but they neglect to use the left hand all the way until the finish of the motion. And what you're doing there is you're basically ending up doing something like this, and it looks like a hug almost. And what you're doing there is you're preventing yourself from efficiently using your hip and your shoulders. So a very, very simple drill, you've all heard it, catch the racket in front of your left shoulder. So does that mean that you always have to catch the racket at all times? No. But what it means is that this drill is great to establish the habit of having your left arm not dangling around like a chicken wing. The third area where a lot of 3.5s still have room for growth is the fact that they're not pointing the racket down to the ground as they're letting the racket drop and swing it up and forward to contact point. So right here, the racket face is pointing to us. That is really good. It's pointing to the back fence. But now the racket face never really closes down. And it's a little reminiscent of the good old coaching cue, balance a penny on the top frame of your racket. If you're looking at top forehands, you see that the racket face points down to the ground as they're letting the racket drop and as they're then swinging forward and up. This still points down to some degree. It doesn't have to be as extreme as some of the top players. And there's obviously variations on how close the racket face is on the drop, but it certainly helps with generating massive amounts of topspin. You see that here, Andy Murray is completely down here. And as he's swinging forward and up, still more close than Fabio Fanini, for instance. The racket drops and the racket head is facing down. Again, you don't have to be quite as extreme, but having the racket point down absolutely helps give you more control over the ball because it's easier to generate topspin and you can swing faster and then still keep the ball in play. Third area of improvement, and I'm deliberately calling it area for improvement because per se, it's not necessarily wrong to have the penny bouncing on your frame. That is still an okay forehand. The problem with that is the higher rated you get, the more aggressive you want to be. Your opponents are, so you need to kind of match that. Problem with this kind of swing is that if your racket face is a millimeter open, that ball is gonna go somewhere over the fence. First step to improve there is film yourself. You don't need fancy schmancy cameras. Use your phone, put it up on your back. You don't even need to get tripods or whatever, but 
just hit four hands and notice where your racket face is. So shorten it up, just start doing that with your hand. If you feel that you're leading here with the thumb up, then you're most likely doing that as well with the extension of the racket. So bring the racket down and back, your hand in this case, and point down to the ground. If you're now putting the racket in your hand, you have the racket face pointing down and exaggerate it. Because trust me, when you're then working on it, when you think you're doing this, you're probably about here. And again, all of that is to make it a little easier to create topspin because then you can hit way harder, accelerate a lot more, and the ball still stays in play. So if I want to check on my forehand, really working on letting that racket head drop here, and then I pull forward and up. But the difference that I'm feeling right away when I'm working on closing my racket face a little bit more is that I have tons more topspin, but word of caution there. When you're starting to work on this, very likely a lot of times you will hit the ball in the same contact point that you hit before, but with your racket closed. So that means that they're going down potentially into the net. Use your legs more to get under the ball and you want to try to catch that ball way further out in front so that your racket is no longer as closed. It will be slightly closed at contact point and that is perfectly fine.